You know, ladies and gentlemen, for those who know the plot of Carrie or the uh, assumed uh, movie versions, some approved by Stephen King, he's directed himself, while the Kubrick one, there's a lot of parallels between Carrie and this uh, book made into a movie called Burnt Offerings. Now, Burnt Offerings is a 1976 American supernatural horror film, co-written and directed by the great Dan Curtis of uh, Dark Shadows fame, starring Karen Black, Oliver Reed, and Betty Davis. With Eileen Heckard Burgess and Burgess Meredith, it only cost $2 million a film, but it barely made its money back in the box office. It's based on a 1973 novel of the same name by Robert Morasco. The plot follows a family who begins to interpersonally dissolve under supernatural forces in a large estate they have rented for the summer. While the film received mixed reviews from critics, it won several awards in 1977. Originally set on Long Island, the movie moves the action to California, <coughs> and it was the first movie to be filmed at Dunsmuir House in Oakland. Very beautiful location. So it was co-written by Curtis and William Nolan, based on the Robert Morasco book, produced by Curtis and Robert Singer, starring again uh, Black, Reed, Meredith, Heckart, Lee Montgomery, Dub Taylor, and Betty Davis, cinematography by Jacques R. Marquette, edited by Dennis Verkler, music by the great Bob Colbert, production companies including Dan Curtis Productions, distributed by UA on October 18, 1976, 116 minutes in total, budget $2 million, and uh, box office $1.56. Now this one, writer Ben Rolfe, his wife Mary, and their 12-year-old son Davey to her large, shabby, remote, neoclassical 19th century mansion <coughs> to rent for the summer. The home's eccentric owners, elderly siblings Arnold and Rosalind Allardyce, offered him a bargain price of $900 for the entire summer with one odd request. Their elderly mother, who they claim is 85 but could pass for 60, will continue to live in her upstairs suite and the Rolfs are to provide her with meals during the stay. The old woman is obsessed with privacy and will not interact with them, so meals are being left in her sitting room outside her locked bedroom. The family arrives at the house on July 1st, along with Ben's elderly Aunt Elizabeth. Marion becomes obsessed with Carrie for the home and eventually wears the Victorian-era garments she finds in Mrs. Arnold Dice's suite while distancing herself from her family. A particular interest to her is Mr. Allier Dice's sitting room, which contains a collection of framed portraits of people from different eras, presumably former occupants of the house. Mrs. Arnold Dice's meals go mostly untouched, according to the concerned Marion. Various unusual circumstances start occurring over the summer. After Davy falls and hurts his knee playing in the garden, a dead plant starts to grow again. Ben cuts his hand on a champagne bottle, and a dead light bulb is mysteriously repaired. While playing in the pool, Ben is haunted by a vision of an eerie, malevolent, grinning hearse driver who Ben first saw at his mother's funeral years earlier. With each accident, the house further restores itself. And of course, we all recognize the, uh, the driver from a certain... Uh, in the heat of night character. Now, Marion is becoming possessed by the spirit of the house. When Aunt Elizabeth suddenly becomes ill and dies, Marion does not attend the funeral. Ben angrily con confronts Marion about her obsession with the house. When she denies it, he reveals, reveals his intention to leave the next day. Ben later sees old shingles and sliding falling away, replaced by new ones as the house rejuvenates itself. Now convinced that the house is alive, Ben attempts to escape with Davy, but a tree blocks the road. When Marion drives them back to the house, Ben accuses her of being a part of what is going on, then sees her as a chauffeur and becomes catatonic. The next day, while Davy is swimming and still catatonic Ben is watching him, the pool water turns into vicious waves, pulling the boy under as Ben is unable to move. Marion rescues her son. The incident awakens Ben from his catatonia. Marion agrees that it's time to leave, but insists on going back inside to inform Mrs. Eiler Dice. When Marion fails to return to her car, Ben goes inside to find her, but cannot. He decides to confront Mrs. Eiler Dice, whom he has never seen. He is horrified when he discovers that Marion is Mrs. Eiler Dice, wise and by age, but clearly Marion. I've been waiting for you, Ben, she says, scowling at him. Ben recoils in horror, a horror from the thing that had once been his wife rises from her wheelchair and moves toward him. Waiting in the car, Davy is shocked to see his father fall from the attic window, landing on the car's windshield. In shock, Davy runs towards the house and is killed when one of the chimneys falls at him. Very interesting scene that plays out there. In the final shot of the film, the voices of the Allardyce siblings are heard marveling at the restored beauty of their home and rejoicing over the turn of their mother. 
With the house and grounds now apparently rejuvenated, camera pans on pictures arrayed in the house, previous guests, presumably also victims of the house. The photo collection now includes photos of Ben, Davy, and Aunt Elizabeth. With uh, Karen Black as Marion Rolfe, Oliver Reed as Ben Rolfe, Lee H. Montgomery as Davy Rolfe, Betty Davis as Elizabeth Rolfe, Burgess Meredith as Arnold Allardyce, Eileen Heckard as Roz Allardyce, Dub Taylor as Walker, Anthony James as Nurse Driver, and Todd Tarquand as Young Ben. Now, in a variety piece published on December 11, 69, it was announced a project named Burn Offerings was directed by Bob Fosse from a screenplay by Robert Morasco. Terman, uh, Terman Films and Cinema Center Films would be producers and Lawrence Thur uh, Thur Terman, executive producer. Although it never materialized, a novel of the same name by, by Morasco was published in 1973. The American Film Institute inductively reasoned the book may have been written based on the unproduced screenplay. Now, Burn Offerings was directed by Curtis, most known, again, for Dark Shadows, uh, Night Stalker. Not counting House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows, theatrically released feature films and adaptations of the TV series. It was the only original theatrical feature he ever directed. When offered to do the project, he found the, mo the novel uninteresting, particularly what he called its nothing ending, and joked to myself, I bet some idiot who doesn't know what he's doing will come along and make this. Now, William F. Nolan removed the first third of the book, where the family was in New York City, finding it didn't work, and the chauffeur was conceived by him and unique to the film. Now, filming took place in August 75 at Dunsmuir. Burn Offerings was the first movie to be filmed there. Now, according to a commentary with Dan Curtis, William F. Nolan and Karen Black, Curtis revealed that his rationale for the fog machine was to shoot Moats. Betty Davis reportedly had heavy conflicts with Karen Black, feeling that Black did not extend to her an appropriate degree of respect, and that her behavior on the film set was unprofessional. Now, the Arizona Republic critic Mike Petrini was creeped out by the film, particularly the smiling chauffeur, but felt it was ruined by an emphasis on constant thrills or over subtle horror. He was also confused about several concepts, such as why Marion was handling Mrs. Allardyce's trays. George Anderson of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette criticized the film as dependent on typical horror tropes such as shocks and loud music hits. He also described the tension as a lot of sinister huffing and puffing to little effect, noting how most of the uh, runtime is spent on mystery of which characters are the antagonists or protagonists. Now, while Colleen Burgess Meredith and Aileen Heckert, the best performers in the film, both uh, great uh, actors in her own right, Richard Dyer of the Boston Globe argued the material gave the actors little to work with. He called Black particularly inconsistent. Reed uh, also looked like an eggplant and stated Davis tried to create a Betty Davis character without Betty Davis lines to work with, so all she could do was puff and snort a lot. Movie critic Roger Ebert called the film a mystery all right, concluding bird offerings just persists, until it occurs to us that the characters are the only ones in the theater who don't know what's going to happen next. Variety stated the horror is expressed through sudden murderous impulses felt by Black and Reed, a premise which might have been interesting if direct director Dan Curtis hadn't relied strictly on formula treatment. But here's the, 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 the weird thing, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Black was doing a lot of horror movies. Oliver Reed was doing a lot of horror movies, especially Canadian. And Betty Davis was in a hag horror for almost uh, more than a decade. So they were there for a reason because horror, they were considered one of their main movies was horror movies at the time. Now, in the Saturn Awards that year, it won Best Horror Film, Best Director, and Best Supporting Actress for Curtis and Davis. At the Stiggs Film Festival, uh, Best Director was Curtis, Best Actor, Burgess Meredith, and Best Actress, uh, Karen Black. Now, Rovi Danal Guadasico, a movie guy, called the film Worthy Rediscovery by the Horror Fans Who Missed It the First Time, concluding in recent years, in the end, Burn Offerings is probably a bit too methodical in its pacing for viewers accustomed to the slam bang approach of post 70s horror fare, but Susan, seasoned horror fans will find plenty to enjoy. Ironically, this movie is never on television. You can rarely, barely see it, and I don't think there's on the, any streaming services that uh, is very popular. In addition to the slow build, Starburst's Robert Martin spotlighted his cast, particularly the chemistry between Reed and Montgomery. Black's loving and murderous combination and Davis's uncoverable un un heart attack scene. However, he also felt the overall product was held back by his TV film look, particularly its flat cinematography and visuals that were more clever than scary. Now, 
Burn Offerings was part of a trend in 70s horror films focused on the supernatural that included The Omen, Carrie, Audrey Rose, and Amityville Horror. It was also one of many horror films in the 70s and early 80s, such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, predict- presenting the negative impacts of middle class life, such as empty headed consumerism. In the film, the family is destroyed by a house that uh, the otherwise dreamed of, generic looking in the middle of nowhere and meant for leisure. In a 1978 book, An Introduction to American Movies, Stephen C. Early called Ben's Fall Under a Car Window as an example of the high presence of violence in films in the 1970s. Retrospective reviews reviewed the story as a criticism on obsession on property ownership and the destruction of the nuclear family. For me, it was just a horror movie, but that's, you know, you see what you can. Now, on my birthday on, in 2003, uh, August 26, MGM released the Region 1 DVD of Burnt Offerings. The original video shape is in widescreen and also features an audio commentary with Curtis Black and William Nolan. The DVD was poorly received. Reviewers criticized the video quality, which appeared to have been shot with soft focus. Well, that's a Dan Curtis stroke there. And the Dolby Digital Mono Auto that made the voices muddy, muddy and indistinct. A Blu-ray the film was released on October 6, 2015 by the Kino Lover Company. Now, like most other Dan Curtis works, the music for Bird Offerings was composed and conducted by the great Robert Colbert. In 2011, years after the film's release, the original full soundtrack album was released by Counterpoint, limited to 3,000 copies. Lent was 65 minutes, 22 seconds. The album features all of Colbert's original score, plus alternate tracks not used in the film, including two alternate music box themes. The CD booklet is 20 pages long and illustrated with photos taken from the set of the film during production. An original suite of their film soundtrack can be found on the 2000 Robert Colbert compilation album, the Night Stock and other classic uh, thrillers. So, I mean, it's a... Uh, the, the score itself is not what you call anything you've ever heard before, but in the Dan Curtis oeuvre, you have a connection with every actor in that movie with horror in some shape or form from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. Because at first, a lot of people thought it was a Canadian movie, but it wasn't because you had uh, various uh, Canadian horror movies that were appearing uh, left and right with uh, Canadian funding or Canadian tax break movies like going into the 1980s. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, besides the Disney movies, this is one of uh, Betty Davis' last big release. Uh, besides her TV work, of course. So I would, I've seen a movie before, and I give it only two out of four. Like I said, it just didn't do it for me. But uh, Burgess Meredith just eats up scenes here. And Oliver Reed, although he's one of my favorite actors, he doesn't really, he's not really given much to do in this. I would like to see a drunk Oliver Reed in this movie, rather than a sober one, if you know what I'm saying. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're liking what we're doing with our Dan Curtis uh, reviews, we'll be doing a couple the last few days. Let us know with a like, comment, or subscribe. And don't forget... If you know what burnt offerings means, let me know, because is it religious or is it satanic? We don't know. Thanks for listening. Bye.